An interstellar meteorite could be hiding in the ocean. Why doesn't Jupiter have rings like Saturn? When the Earth's magnetic field almost collapsed, the shortest day on Earth and Planet 9 is running out of places to hide. All this and more space news in this week's episode of Space Bites. Hi everyone, I'm Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today. I've been a space and astronomy news journalist for over 20 years. This is our Space Bites, a weekly roundup of all of the big space and astronomy news that we're reporting on Universe Today. Now, this is a short version of the much longer email newsletter that I write every week. But still, we understand some of you would prefer to have it in video form. So let's get into the news. Why doesn't Jupiter have rings? Now, you might not know, but all of the giant planets in the solar system have rings, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune. Now, for Jupiter, Uranus and Neptune, the rings are made of dust, while the rings for Saturn are these beautiful, sweeping, icy rings. And you would think with the amount of gravity that Jupiter has, it should be able to have icy rings just like Saturn. And Jupiter has icy moons like Saturn. Think about Europa and Ganymede. Now, astronomers think that the rings of Saturn might have come from comets that came in from the outer solar system, they got too close to the planet, and they were broken up. And once again, Jupiter probably experienced comets getting too close in the past. We've seen comets crash into Jupiter. So we know this happened. So once again, why doesn't Jupiter have rings? Astronomers did a simulation where they looked at the gravitational interactions of the environment around Jupiter and the environment around Saturn. And what they found was that because Jupiter has the giant Jovian moons, these four moons, Io, Europa, Callisto and Ganymede that interact with each other, it makes large rings like Saturn just impossible to be stable for any long period of time. Saturn does have a very large moon with Titan, but it's just the one moon. And it accounts for almost all of the mass in the Saturn system, apart from the planet itself. And so with only one moon, it can't really disrupt these rings. So Saturn has rings while Jupiter just can't have stable long term giant icy rings. But it makes you wonder like if Jupiter didn't have all of those moons, would it have an even more impressive ring system? Just makes you wonder. There could be an interstellar meteorite here on Earth. The US Department of Defense recently declassified information on fireballs and meteors that they had been tracking. These are the really bright meteors that struck the atmosphere, in most cases burned up, but in some cases actually made it through the atmosphere and landed somewhere on Earth. Now these are happening all of the time. It's just that they're mostly happening over the ocean, over places where there just aren't any population. And so people don't notice them happening. But the Department of Defense has satellites designed, I guess, to detect nuclear weapon launches. And so they're able to also detect these meteors as they impact the atmosphere. And what's interesting is that one of these meteors seem to have a trajectory that was interstellar. So think about like Oumuamua or Comet Borisov. This was an object that was on a trajectory that must have come from outside of the solar system. And the Department of Defense actually confirmed this trajectory. This object exploded in the upper atmosphere off the coast of Papua New Guinea. And it's believed that it was large enough that fragments went into the ocean in that area. Now, we don't know exactly where it happened, but it's probably like a 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer grid. And now some astronomers are proposing to go look for it. Although it's a really large search area, because these objects are magnetic, they could be easier to find. And think about it, there could be objects that came from another solar system here, at the bottom of our ocean. In fact, it's almost inevitable when you think about the amount of material that's probably flying through the solar system at all times. Could you imagine how much astronomers could learn by studying an object that was formed in another star system? Last week, I reported that a Chinese Long March booster was going to be returning uncontrolled back to the Earth, and it happened. On July 30th, the booster re entered the Earth's atmosphere and crashed off the coast of Borneo. Fortunately, into the ocean, nobody was hurt. And it's believed that some people on Borneo were able to actually capture a video of the booster as it was returning through the atmosphere. NASA was not pleased by both the uncontrolled entry and the total lack of notice by the Chinese 
that this was going to be happening and wrote a sternly worded letter. And hopefully, this is the last time that we see one of these giant boosters returning without any thought about where it's going to land and who it might hit. These things should be dumped into the ocean safely. We just had the shortest day in history. The Earth takes approximately 24 hours for the sun to return to the same spot in the sky. I probably need to explain this briefly, the difference between a sidereal day and a solar day. So a sidereal day, that's the amount of time it takes for the Earth to rotate once on its axis for the stars to return to the same spot. And you might be surprised to learn that it takes 23 hours and 56 minutes for the Earth to turn once on its axis. It then takes an additional four minutes for the sun to return to the same spot in the sky. And that's why we say that a day is 24 hours long. But it turns out on June 29th, we had the shortest day, the day was shorter by 1.59 milliseconds, which is the shortest day in recorded history. So why is this happening? It's believed it has something to do with the Chandler wobble, which is how the Earth's shape can change because of ocean variation of atmospheric variation, there can be changes with the Earth's crust as mantle and material is moving around, and it can slightly change the spin rate of planet Earth. But at the largest scale, the Earth's rotation is actually slowing down. And that's because the Earth and the moon are in a tidal interaction. As the moon is slowly drifting away from the Earth, the length of a day on Earth gets slower and slower. And over time, the Earth and the moon will be tidally locked. So this is the shortest day, but don't expect shorter and shorter days, the Earth is not spinning up. But this is a bit of a problem because so much of our modern technology is based on clocks on atomic clocks down here on Earth and out in space, the whole GPS system relies on these clocks. And as the length of a day changes, that can cause some of these clocks to be slightly inaccurate. And so the clocks will have to be updated to account for the actual length of a day. A black hole can tear a neutron star apart in the blink of an eye. Astronomers have detected dozens of collisions between black holes because of the gravitational waves that they emit. They've been using the LIGO and Virgo observatories. And we also know of three collisions between a black hole and a neutron star. Probably. The problem is, is that black holes and neutron stars can be fairly similar masses. And so it's hard to know exactly which two objects collided with each other. And so astronomers have simulated what would happen when a neutron star gets too close to the black hole. And what happens, and I'm sure you're not surprised, is the neutron star is torn into fragments in a shockingly short amount of time it takes about two seconds to go from a neutron star, a object that is compressed matter, the mass many times the mass of a star compacted down to the size of a city to be completely torn apart into a stream of atoms and blasted out into space and also added to the mass of the black hole. But as this process is happening, it will give off a very specific signature that astronomers should be able to detect in their gravitational waves. And so with more and more of these models and simulation, we should get a much better sense of what were the two objects that collided together? Was it two black holes? Was it a black hole and a neutron star? Two neutron stars, a white dwarf and a neutron star? Over time, astronomers will be able to map out all of the gravitational wave signals of all of these objects. But still, just like the, the imagination boggles to think about these objects, which have many times the mass of our sun colliding together and wrenching each other apart in that short amount of time. Space is really terrifying. Planet nine is running out of places to hide. It's been several years since Mike Brown and Constantine Batigan predicted the existence of planet nine, some large object, probably with five times the mass of the Earth out in the outer solar system, somewhere between 100 and 1000 astronomical units. And they made this prediction because of the motion of the objects in the Kuiper belt, there seems to be some kind of clustering of these objects as if some much heavier object is farther out and is shepherding these dwarf planets and icy Kuiper belt objects into very specific orbits. And of course, astronomers have gone looking for this planet nine, they've looked 
in the places you would expect to find it along the plane of the ecliptic in certain regions. And so far, it hasn't turned up. And so astronomers wanted to try a fairly bold idea. They started with an infrared survey of the outer solar system, and they mapped out all of the objects that could roughly be a dwarf planet or some kind of icy object like planet nine. And then they looked at another infrared survey 20 years later, and mapped anything which seemed to have moved in that time period that could be this mysterious planet nine. And they found about 500 candidate objects, which is kind of exciting. It's more than they were anticipating. But then as they looked through each one of the, these objects, they had to disqualify them. And it turns out that these infrared signals that they were detecting were actually a type of nebula that was shifting in its temperature and and caused a signal that made them think that it was actually something that was planet sized as opposed to just a diffuse gas. So by the time they were finished, they weren't able to find any objects that matched planet nine. And so we still don't know if planet nine is out there. But this further constrains the places where it might be around in the solar system. But really, we're gonna to have to wait until the Vera Rubin Observatory comes online later this year to have our best shot of finding this object if it's out there. And if not, then we need an explanation for why all of these objects in the Kuiper belt are moving in the way that they do. A time when the Earth's magnetosphere almost collapsed. The Earth's magnetosphere is incredibly important for life on Earth, like we would not be alive without the magnetosphere. And we know that it is generated by an internal dynamo inside the Earth. We've got various layers inside the Earth of iron and nickel, molten metal that are rotating around and as they turn, they generate this very powerful magnetic field that extends out from the Earth and protects the planet in this magnetic bubble. And we know throughout history that this magnetic field can flip every few 100,000 years. And the way that scientists have figured this out is kind of amazing. They map the magnetic field line in flows of lava. And then they're able to detect the orientation of the Earth's magnetic field. And then they find a place where the lava is older, and they can see that the magnetic field lines were going in the opposite direction, they can measure each time these magnetic field lines flip. And what they found was that about 500 million years ago, the magnetic field turned off completely. Why? Well, what it seems to be is that the Earth earlier than 500 million years ago, didn't have a fully formed inner core. When you think about the structure of the Earth, you've got the outer crust where we live, you've got the mantle where lava can flow out from the inside of the Earth, you've got the outer core, and then you've got the inner core, which is thought to be a solid iron nickel ball inside the, the Earth. And it's believed that this inner core didn't fully form until about 500 million years ago. And when it did, as it was forming, it actually shut off the planet's magnetic field. And then it reformed it again, and we've had it ever since. And so it would be pretty interesting to think about what it might be like if that magnetic field had never fully formed. And it also makes you wonder then what would it look like on other planets? Is this a situation that happened on Mars? And maybe because its inner core never fully formed because it's so much smaller and cooled down that it wasn't able to get that full planet wide magnetic field for a longer period of time. But still, good thing that the magnetic field did return, we wouldn't be having this conversation if it hadn't. Even citizen scientists get time on James Webb. Now, one of the cool things about James Webb and the Hubble Space Telescope is that these telescopes are freely available to anyone around the world. So you could be living in any country and you're able to get access to James Webb and Hubble for free. You just have to make the science case. And that's the tricky part is convincing the team that the observations that you want to make are important and are going to be contributing to science. But you don't have to be a member of a research institution or a university or a government, you can just be an amateur citizen scientist. And so citizen scientists were participating in a project from the Zooniverse called Backyard Worlds Planet Nine study. And they were looking for cooler objects in the outer solar system, maybe more dwarf planets, maybe a nearby brown dwarf, something like that. 
and they found enough interesting objects that they were able to write about 20 papers from all of this citizen science research. And some of these objects are considered so interesting that they've been able to get follow up time on the James Webb Space Telescope. And so at some point in the next few months, they're going to be able to observe these cooler brown dwarf objects and report their findings. And so it just shows you if you are interested in space and astronomy, and you want to get involved in some of these projects, there are lots of people that would be glad to get your help. And you can get your name on a scientific paper and maybe even get time on James Webb to make further observations. I'm sure you're getting sick of cool pictures from James Webb Space Telescope. And so I thought we'd just put this to the end. This is your dessert for listening to all of this interesting space news. And this is a really cool picture of the cartwheel galaxy imaged by James Webb. And what's cool about this object is it is a clear result of a collision between galaxies. You see this amazing shape, it kind of looks like a ring like a bullseye. And what happened was at some point about 400 million years ago, a smaller galaxy punched right through the middle of this larger galaxy and caused all kinds of damage to the galaxy's inner regions. And so when you look at this galaxy in other wavelengths, thanks to the near cam instrument on James Webb, you can see where all of the dust and gas has piled up as the result of this collision, you can actually see where new star formation is happening, both in this outer ring and bits near the core, as this galaxy is just blasting off into space. Very cool. We're going to get like I said, a lot more amazing images. Every time we find them, we will show more of them off to you here on our video. Now, if you want more information on any of the stories we talked about here this week, you can find them in our weekly email newsletter, just go to universe today.com slash newsletter to sign up. I write this newsletter every week it goes out on Fridays. It's gigantic, dozens of stories, pictures, it's totally free. I write every word of it. Again, go to universe today.com slash newsletter. And if you don't have time to sit and watch video, you can get an audio edition of everything that we do on universe today. Just go to universe today.com slash podcast to sign up or search for the universe today podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you want to support the work that we do at universe today, why don't you join our Patreon? Just go to patreon.com slash universe today to sign up. And thanks to everyone who already supports us and helps us stay completely independent. Thanks to all the interplanetary researchers, the interstellar adventurers, and the galaxy wanderers. And a special thanks to Andrew M. Gross, who supports us at the master of the universe level. Your support means the universe to us. All right, those were all the stories that we had this week. I hope you enjoyed them. We'll see you next week.